Apologies. You caught me off guard bopping to this new tune. When I was younger, I also used to spend a lot of time listening to copyright cleared, royalty free music on my brand new CD player. After cassettes, compact disc felt like a brand new world with its crisp 44 kilohertz audio clarity and instant track selection. Then when CD-ROM came along, yet another world opened up, offering us a whopping 650 megabytes of storage, heralding the multimedia era and changing games forever. CD-ROMs became popular for PCs during the mid-90s. The first CD-based console in the West, the Philips CDI, was released in 1991, but before all of that, Deep in the murky world of 8-bit micros, it was possible to buy games for your Commodore 64 and ZX Spectrum on CD2. Here's one of them. The Codemasters CD Games Pack. And given that until this point most games came on cassette, especially in Europe, this was an absolute revelation. Ah uh, yes, good old cassette. Much like dial-up internet, data is modulated into an audible sound wave which the computer can then interpret back into binary. For the spectrum, on average there are 1300 bits encoded into each second. If we take a look at the audio itself, we can see the frequency varying in length to represent each bit of data. As standard, the ZX Spectrum uses pretty simple frequency shift key decoding, so it detects the edges of the modulated signal length to interpret the data. From the user's perspective, we hear this as a concatenation of tones blasting through our TV, and our eyes are treated to a visual representation of this data in the form of these horizontal bars, which is both a striking and programmatically simple way to convey that something is happening. But what it really means is that if we want to play Knight Rider, then we're going to have to wait five minutes for it to load. In which time we can discuss the new kit Knight Rider subscription from sponsor Fanhome. Just like Michael Knight in one of the greatest 80s programs ever, you can possess your very own four-wheeled partner. Month by month, you can build this incredibly crafted and hefty beast up until you have a two foot long wheeled piece of joy, complete with rotating number plate, steering, headlights, brake illumination, everything, and of course, the red swooshing strip. You even get the kit remote control watch and a raft of subscription gifts. How amazing is that? Plus with each piece of kit, because it's a kit and he's called kit, you get a complete guide to the car and the lore of the TV series itself. And man, that was a good show. Head on over to the link below and claim your subscription today. Sadly, the ZX Spectrum version of Knight Rider is about as far removed from the epicness of the television experience as you can get. So if we want to play a different game, then we'll have to reset the machine, insert a new cassette, and wait another five minutes or even longer and that's if we don't get a loading error caused by either a weak signal, a slipping rubber band in the deck, or degradation of the audio on the cassette itself. Yes, loading from cassette was never the ideal option. The biggest revolution in the recording industry since the invention of the long playing gramophone record, but this is no ordinary disc. So with the advent of compact disc in 1982, it didn't take that long for computer boffins to realise that this would be a much better way of transmitting data. With a CD there is less signal variation, less audio distortion, and of course an increased sample frequency, meaning that actually you can pack a lot more data into the same chunk of time. In fact, the humble Specky can actually accept data at a much higher board rate if you have the kit and tools to do so. And combined with a speed loader or turbo loader, a program developed specifically to interpret a bespoke, faster loading encoding format, multiple programs can then be packed onto this disc. Yes, this isn't CD-ROM as we know it. The computer has no control over the medium at all. This is essentially hacking your compact disc audio player to send data as an audio stream, just like cassette. The first company to attempt this was Rainbow Arts with their first 
CD edition, consisting of 10 titles and released for the Commodore 64 in 1989. The first release market was Germany, where both the Commodore 64 and compact disc players were incredibly popular, before following in the UK for £29.99. This little pack comes complete with an adapter that plugs into the cassette connector and you simply connect your CD player's audio out to that. That dongle is basically acting as an analog to digital converter for the audio data which the C64 can then interpret just like the C64 dataset does. The first track of the CD contains a games menu, held in the C64's standard loading format, which you load directly from track 1 of the CD. This not only allows you to choose your game, but also acts as its own speed loader, allowing the data on the other CD tracks to be encoded in a condensed format and giving you access to all these absolute gems. So then, the Codemasters version was frantically produced to get it out of the door for Christmas 1989. February 1990's edition of Zap magazine reported, We at Zap were the first non-CM people to see the system working. The rush to get everything in the shops for Christmas has been severe and there hasn't even been time to decide whether to license the loader software, forcing other producers to come to Codemasters if they want to produce their own CDs for the system. Clearly there is huge potential for other software houses to bring out their own compilations. And clearly Codemasters were hoping this would be an incredible success, and why not? Here was a CD with 30 full games, and some of them really good games, with the promise of reduced loading times and all for £19.95. Surely this would be on the Christmas lists of every 8-bit owner in the land. I mean look at this. Ultra fast loading as little as 20 seconds, instantaneous track game selection, maximum reliability, no load errors, digitally mastered, digitally reproduced, and digitally recorded. Massive 12 megs capacity, easy to use, includes cable over 6 feet with adapter and comprehensive instruction book. Well, I'm certainly sold. This is the ZX Spectrum version, although the contents for the C64 version are identical, save for the software itself. Codemasters did promise an Amstrad CPC version, it was even advertised, but it never made it to production, and we'll come back to why in a bit. So here's that 6 foot long cable to connect your CD player to the computer, here's the CD itself with a nice Codemasters logo printed on the base, here's the cassette element for CD loader software, and here's that comprehensive instruction book which oddly still has that sheeny plastic brand new smell. It really is quite comprehensive as well, not only do we have operating instructions for the setup, we also get instructions for each game featured within. Of course, there's also the obligatory registration card. Where was this software purchased? Boots, Smiths, Menzies, a tobacconist? Ah, uh, those were the days when you could get a game compilation with your 50 grams of drum shag pipe tobacco. Okay, so that aside, the adapter is clearly the most intriguing element. One end plugs into your CD player of choice, and the other end into the ZX Spectrum. Now this is quite interesting, because unlike the Rainbow Arts version which plugged straight into the cassette port, this one plugs into the joystick port, and that's the same for the C64 version as well. The left audio track goes to pin 1, which triggers up on this setup, right audio to pin 6, which triggers fire, and ground to the common pin 8. Now, the Spectrum doesn't need to receive both left and right tracks because they're identical. So here, only pins 6 and 8 matter. Within the time frame of a few weeks, and alongside electronics wizard Ted Caron, it was actually Philip Oliver of the prolific Oliver Twins who developed the handling software for this, whilst the other half of this iconic duo, Andrew Oliver, was working on Fantastic Dizzy for the NES. In a 2016 interview with Retro Gaming Magazine, Philip stated that 
We save the games using a very high board rate, 20 times the speed of the regular signal to a high quality audio DAT tape. The saver and loader had to be written with extreme accuracy and error checking. It had to allow for slight variations in the high ones and low zeros. Initially, the plan was to use the stereo output from the CD player to have one channel work as the timer channel and the other to act as the stream of faster data. Wait for the timer channel to switch from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 and read the other channel for the data. Sadly, we discovered through buying a load of CD players that some of the cheaper makes mix the stereo to a mono output to save money. We clearly had to be compatible with all CD players and reverted to a software solution relying on only one input signal, very similar to how a regular tape loaded. However, that didn't work out entirely as we'll discover later on. It was though designed to be used across all platforms, so this is the same cable you'll find in both the C64 and Spectrum boxes. The original cable itself contains a simple conversion circuit consisting of five resistors and two transistors, allowing a digital signal to be passed through the joystick port inputs. Here's a simplified version of the circuit from SpectrumForEveryone.com, which makes it easier to understand and a good place to start if you want to build your own cable. Now that's great, but unless you own a Spectrum Plus 2 or Plus 3, you won't have a joystick port as standard. You'd need an accessory such as this. This is the ZX Interface 2. Well, actually, it's a clone of it, but it still adds a cartridge port and two joystick ports, which was especially useful if you had a rubber keyed plus or a 128 plus version of the machine. Here I'm using my trusty 128 plus, the last model which Sinclair themselves produced before selling the brand to Amstrad and also the greatest model. Having six feet of cable is better than most cables. It shows that Codemasters understood that not many households actually had CD players at the time, and if they did, they were likely to be big hulking units owned by your parents and therefore sitting somewhere else in the lounge. But even so, six foot isn't going to get you far, and so I'll be putting my Sanyo Base Expander right next to the TV. Then we can pop the CD in, return to the Spectrum, and load up the boot cassette as normal. Once loaded, we need to pick whether we're using a Kempston or Sinclair interface, such as found on a Plus 2. The Kempston interface follows the standard Atari schema, and that's what we're using here. Then it asks us to connect the cable to the joystick port, which I've already done because it's best to do that when the spectrum is turned off. And then we get this screen, which asks us to press spacebar to set the CD volume. Track 1 of the CD is simply a test signal, so play that and the software will let you know how strong the signal is by the amount of green on screen. Slowly increase the volume, and when it's solid green, we should be good to go. Now there's no menu here, instead pressing the Q, U, I and T keys together puts the software into listen mode, allowing us to choose a track to load and then just press play. If you want to know which track is which game, then you'll have to look at the manual and work it out. Of course, we still need to wait for the game to load, but thanks to the superior encoding, it only takes 50 seconds rather than 5 minutes. We're still relying on an audio format, remember. This isn't CD-ROM. This is just a peasant's CD gaming setup. But after a few seconds, voila, we are in. Now, if we were to extract the normal cassette waveform for this game, Vampire, it's five minutes long. This CD version is about 40 seconds. And you can not only see how much more stretched out the signal is on the cassette, you can hear it. It sounds like the difference between doing up your flies normally and when you're in a packed room and you've just realized they're undone. But it's also quite freaky. The modulation is so packed together that actually it sounds like a voice coming at you from another dimension. It's almost like the electronic voice phenomenon all over again. 
I swear, if Lucas Wayneman starts talking to me through this stereo, I'm going to be pissed. The boot program effectively remains in memory throughout this, lurking in the background, and so if we press the Q, U, I and T keys in any game, the screen should freeze and allow us to then load in another game without having to reset the spectrum. In practice though, it's not always the case. You see, this whole random CD player hooked up to a computer is actually a bit more janky in reality than you might hope. And of course it is. Often pressing that key combination will just crash the system, so then we have to reload the boot menu and start all over again. We're also relying on unknown factors. For example, my Sanyo system has bass and tone adjustments that can interfere with the loading and some games need the volume a lot higher to register, for some reason. Issue 100 of New Computer Express also details a problem from Martin Haley in Uxbridge. I won a Codemaster CD games pack, and using the family MIDI system was able to load and run the programs on my 8-bit wonder. For my birthday I received a portable CD player, and for some reason or other it won't work. It plays the music alright, but it won't look at the game CD, it isn't the disc because it still works on the MIDI system. The problem here being that some CD players don't have two separate stereo channels, instead swapping quickly between left and right so that the human ear can't detect the change. This might fool us, but to the Spectrum it was missing half the data. So although Philip Oliver had solved the issue caused by mono CD players, this was a whole new problem. Fake stereo just wasn't picked up in the time-limited testing. Another more comical issue is that if you leave the CD playing after a game loads, it will likely end up controlling your character. After all, it's sending signals to the up and fire buttons of your Kempston interface. You can see that effect here in Ghost Hunters, as my little dude does his own little dance to the sounds coming from the cable. Maybe this is Lucas Wayneman. Maybe that is Lucas Wayneman. Good God. If you need to use a joystick, you may have to unplug the cable completely, which is fine on a plus two, but originals can be a little temperamental if you start knocking the interface about while powered on. Well, that's put an end to Twin Turbo V8. But, you know, all that aside, it's still an excellent and innovative little package. And at £19.95, tremendous value for money, especially when you consider it was about the same price as a disc-based game. Rather than be advertised 30 games, you actually get 32 as well, plus a slideshow demo at track 34. Tracks 35 to 66 contain backups of the 32 games, which is handy if you scratch your CD. It's also handy because it allowed Codemasters to market the disc as containing a whopping 12 megs of data. So each track is about 25 kilobytes each. The games themselves are a little hit and miss, but here are some of the best. And here are some which are not the best. But then, surely, this was just a taste. This technology was touted to provide 8-bit machines with full-screen graphics, huge animated sprites, extra levels and digitized music and video, right? <laughs> so what went wrong? Why weren't shops flooded with CD-based games from this point on? And cassettes kicked to the curb? Well, for you and me, the answer might seem obvious today, but back in 1989, apparently it was not. In 2015, Codemasters co-founder Richard Darling was interviewed for the story of the Oliver Twins, Let's Go Dizzy, a great book which I have a lovely signed copy of, and he stated, We thought the CD games pack was going to be a great success. 
30 great games for £19.99, much faster loading than cassette, what is not to like? I think we originally intended to launch it simultaneously on the 3 format, but had some difficulties with the Amstrad version, so we launched with C64 and Spectrum, intending to follow on with Amstrad. However, when we launched it for Spectrum and Commodore 64, the sales levels were very low, so we decided not to roll out the idea to the Amstrad. In hindsight, I think we made some mistakes. For example, by assuming that 30 games would have a very strong appeal, 30 times that of a single game, when in fact, people are interested in specific games for specific reasons, with some appealing to some people and others to others. Also, the new hybrid technology, which was a stepping stone between cassette loading and CD-ROM drives, was hard to communicate clearly and seemed to have less appeal than we anticipated. But I think there's another component here which is key. In 1990, if you were still playing games on your ZX Spectrum or Commodore 64, if you hadn't moved away to a snazzy game console or 16-bit computer like the Amiga or Atari ST, then I suspect there was very little chance that you'd even own a CD player. I don't think I did until about 1992, and that's because they were expensive. Just look at the contents of this 1989 Argos catalogue. Pages and pages of cassette players from as little as £10.95, but only two portable CD players, with the cheapest model, the Philips D6800, a whopping £129.99. And let's not even get into the MIDI system prices. That's about the same price as a 14-inch colour TV, and it's not much cheaper than an entire Commodore 64 bundle. And I have a sneaky suspicion that most 8-bit owners would rather put that chunk of change towards a shiny new Amiga or Atari ST than a CD player. So might it have worked in the US where compact discs were more prominent? Well. According to an interview with Codemasters PR guy Mike Clark in the March 1990 issue of Amstrad User, The big hole in our distribution network is America. We're working on it at the moment, but the American market is notoriously difficult to get into because they want to spend money. The more expensive the product, the better, so it's difficult to sell 299 games over there. The CD pack may change that though. Well, probably not. Cassette loading might have been the norm here, but in the US, a lot of people owned disk drives for their C64s, so you didn't need to be messing around with CD audio. You had the beauty of floppy disks, which were already fast enough and more than capable to hold enough data for a game or two. And so, what could have been an industry-changing idea was simply a fleeting one, one which appeared for Christmas 1989 and swiftly disappeared soon after. That's why the Rainbow Arts first CD edition and the Codemasters CD games pack are incredibly rare these days and worth a good chunk of change. There was though reportedly an even rarer release, the CD Top 20 Solid Gold Pack by Cosme. Again, this pack contained 20 titles instilled into CD audio, including Forbidden Forest, Potty Pigeon and Grandmaster Chess. Maybe not the most up-to-date selection? but at £19.95, still decent value for money. Unfortunately, all I can track down are disc-based versions, so if you've got the CD version, you may want to hold on to it. Well, yeah, or sell it for a good price. Your choice. Anyway, that wraps up this little tale into 8-bit CD gaming. Until next time, I have been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo.